live stream. Our first session after lunch is called Smart City Public Spaces, Privacy and Open Data in the Public Realm. It's a roundtable session, so it'll explore the ethics of aggregating non-personally identifiable data collection and the movement and activity of people in the public space given the emergence of smart cities. It's moderated by Shin Pei from the Gale Institute and speakers Georgia from Simply Secure, Stephen from Stay, and Jennifer from NetNumina. Um, as a reminder to our attendees here, if you'd like to be anonymous and our attendees online, please submit your questions through slido.com and use the hashtag NYCSoData. Shinpei, I'll hand it off to you to kick us off. Thanks, Fatima. It's really wonderful to be here. Um, so great to see so many people interested in this topic. Um, part of the reason we're interested in this at Scale Institute is that our work as a nonprofit design advocacy, urban design advocacy organization is based on creating an evidence space that centers people in public space. So we want to create evidence that helps designers and planners and city agencies better use, um, better kind of account for the activities of people in public space in a socially meaningful, impactful way. But as we know, there are a lot of tensions around this and you know, that's, uh, I think, all of you in this audience are better experts in this than I am, but we were interested in just having a conversation about some of those tensions to talk to people who work in that technology space that really intersect with um, data and uh, urban design, design issues, um, and also really who really fundamentally care about the social impacts of that data to have a conversation about that. Um, and, and hopefully we'll have also open some time up for questions from the audience. So what I thought we would do is just have each of the speakers go um, introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their work to give you some context of why, how they're working in this space and um, maybe a little bit about their interest in this specific topic. And then we, we had a couple of um, thoughts on themes that really come up for us um, working on this as practitioners, and hopefully that will kick off some discussion and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So that's why we, why don't we start here with Jennifer. Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer Ding. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, my background is in computer vision. So in the past, I was the founder of a computer vision-based smart parking startup. Um, and now I'm a solutions engineer at Numina, who I'm representing today. Um, Numina is a platform for cities, and our mission is to help cities collect better data um, to make them more responsive and equitable. And our focus is really in the transportation and mobility space. Um, and the way we do this is we have a camera-based sensor that's purpose-built for streets, so we usually install on light poles or outside buildings. Um, and we collect real-time data on what, where, how, and when different objects move through and use the streets. Um, so you might have noticed I did not say who, um, and that's integral to our core philosophy at Numina, which is intelligence without surveillance. Um, it's very important to us that we help cities get the data they need to make these important decisions without collecting you know, potentially um, vulnerable uh, personal details about the people moving in the public realm. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Steven. Um, Stephen Larrick, I, I work in an organization called Stay. Um, but I'm excited to talk about this topic today because uh, it's really, I think it, it, it hits at some questions and, and themes that have been present throughout my career that I've been very interested in. So uh, my background is in city planning. So I've been someone um, who has had to make decisions about you know, what programming and, what, and, and how we design public space. Um, decisions that I think uh, often could have been improved by better evidence. Um, I've, I've also worked for the Sunlight Foundation where we did a lot of, of thinking about the tensions that can exist between open data um, and, and individual privacy. And in particular, I worked with the city of Seattle um, on their open data program in the context of their privacy principles. Um, and then finally, at Stay, uh, we are a, a civic tech startup. We, we do tools for data management and collaboration uh, focused on public sector agencies. Um, and as part of that work, I think there are two, uh, two core areas that are, that are going to be most relevant to our, our discussion today. Um, the first is that we are, the, the Gale Institute has created this public life data protocol, um, which is a way to structure information um, collected about people moving and interacting uh, and behaving in public space. Um, 
And we are working with a couple of cities, including the city of San Francisco, um, to help them better ingest and utilize that data and manage it uh, in ways that can help with, with urban design decisions. Uh, the next is that uh, I've also done some research and I'm working on a pilot project in two cities um, in, in the realm of transportation that I think is also relevant to our, t our topic today, um, which is that dockless mobility is this emergent uh, trend in transportation. Um, and so we have these new, new kinds of data that are available to public agencies um, and that include geolocation and sometimes paths of real trips uh, in real time. And although it might not be identifiable, it is unique, uh, personally identifiable, it is uniquely identifiable to have a geolocation. Um, and so I think from the conversations I've had with, with many city officials that are managing th these new data feeds, um, I think it, it'll be interesting to kind of talk through some of the thinking about these new uh, emergent areas and, and, and need for, for ethical consideration. Hi, everybody. There. Ooh, that works better. Okay. Um, I'm Georgia Bullen. I, I'm the executive director of a nonprofit called Simply Secure. Um, what we do, uh, we focus on, we have a general focus on usability and human centered design, and we work with a lot of civic tech projects. We work with a lot of um, internet freedom and generally like open source projects. We have uh, educational missions. We do a lot of direct support, mentorship, coaching of projects that are working in these spaces. Um, but in a different hat, I also uh, am on the advisory committee and leadership team of a really large open data project called Measurement Lab. Um, we, uh, if you've run a internet speed test in Google search in the little widget, if people are familiar with that, that's actually a big open data project that you may have participated in where we are crowdsourcing um, measurements of uh, internet connections and that's a big CC0 public data set. So it's something that we think about a lot is questions of privacy, consent, and participation um, in a wide variety of projects. So I'm interested to talk about what it means when we're, um, like what does consent look like when we're talking about designing these experiences? It may be, um, I mean, like Stephen was saying, right, geolocation data, people are, uh, they don't even necessarily know that their location is, is being collected while they're using some of these scooters or bikes. And, and what does that mean? What's that consent model look like? How do we think about um, allowing people to have an active choice in that uh, context. Great, thanks for the introduction and thanks Stephen for bringing up the, the data standard that Gale Institute um, had created with the city of San Francisco, Copenhagen and Seattle. That's one of, that was the way that we started to, as an organization, start to get into this topic. Um, you know, one of the things I thought would be useful for the audience, just to get everyone on the same page, is to talk a little bit about the shape of, you know, the, you know, what's happening in the field right now. Who are the players? I think that it's a very fragmented um, arena in terms of really large giants that are collecting data. Some of that data not being accessible. Some of it is, and, and it's just, um, can we can we put some order to understanding this for our audience here? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, one of the things that's helpful about um, starting with the Gale framing is that um, I think it's useful to, to talk about uh, observation and data collection in public space um, in the broader context uh, that, that might predate us thinking about it as a primarily technological question discussion. Um, but so one of the things I really enjoy about the Gale framework is that it's really based on, on um, methodologies that, that predate us even thinking about it as data collection. Um, so uh, as, a, as a planner, um, you know, one of the stories I can speak to, uh, I once was involved in reprogramming a, a, a former basketball court into a, a futsal court, uh, a, soccer, a soccer arena, um, in a neighborhood that had a growing Hispanic population. And uh, I think you know, to make those kinds of changes, you want to have evidence that that's actually what the users want in the space. Um, and so going out in the space, observing what people are doing, observing that hey, they're bringing their own nets and, and their own balls, and no one's actually using the basketball court, uh, and, and you know, this is kind of the ratio of use that we see. Um, that is, like bringing that kind of um, illustrative evidence to the conversation with the council, 
and to the budget conversation can be critical to, to making those decisions and making that thing happen. Um, and so what's great about what Gail does is they've created a structure and a, a series of survey tools um, that, that can help uh, public officials and others um, structure how they're, and, and uh, replicate how they're doing those observations um, and also keep track of it over time. I think understanding the trends can be critical to, to programming and, and designing spaces. Um, but we obviously have uh, new technologies that are, that are changing it in, 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 in uh, ways that do seem like a new form. And so I, I would love to hear more about you know, how, how Numina fits into the, this idea of sensors that can do this in real time all the time. Um, and with everything, and not just with what um, something like a researcher in the in the field is is seeing at the time that they're there. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that background, Stephen. Um, yeah, something that <clears throat> you said that struck me was this um, idea of the Gale framework being a good starting point um, for different cities, um, different types of groups to understand, um, or I have like a standard for understanding. Um, important data to be collected in the public realm. And I think that um, maybe because of the speed of, de of you know, technology creation and deployment of some of these new systems, that is really lacking, I think, in the new um, data sets that are being collected, especially from a security and privacy side. Um, as you know, the cost of um, manufacturing camera systems um, dropped and also cellular communication capabilities improve, have, are improving so much. We're seeing a lot of different products getting created very rapidly with you know, very little oversight. Um, and so we see this lack of standardization, uh, even the right terms to begin talking about um, issues of security and privacy, but even what is useful data, what is too much data. Um, and there's, there's like not a lot of nuance in that conversation right now. Um, I think cameras are a particularly concerning area, for sure. I mean, we're seeing cameras in baby monitors, um, in you know, our, our doorbells, and um, certainly surveillance systems have been around longer, so we have a little bit more of a um, understanding of what those have been used for and the limitations um, they've had in the past, but I think, um, you know, it's true, you know, everywhere we look now, um, cameras are popping up, whether they're organized by a big tech company like Google Maps, collecting um, imagery, um, whether from satellite or from the ground. But we also see a lot of um, personal, like citizens, also having new IoT technologies. And so who's responsible, um, where it's being deployed, um, these are all kind of, you know, new frontiers uh, for these new sensors. Yeah, was in the players question, I sort of I've heard you all mention a few um, like governments, obviously companies. I think that play in a, a couple different roles. There's companies that are actively part of the the data collection and creation world, but there's also companies that then want to use that data, and then companies that don't even realize they're necessarily contributing to the situation. I mean, you're mentioning cameras, and and we're talking about data feeds. Uh, everyone in this room probably has at least one camera on them. If they have a laptop, they've got two, right? Probably because the camera's now built in. Um, and then if they have any other devices, right? Who knows? Like how many how many cameras? How much data could we each be a part of contributing to at the moment? And they don't. Not even all of the companies that are part of that ecosystem necessarily are thinking along the lines of how they're creating data that be, could become part of this larger set, right? Um, and so individuals, I think, is the other sort of piece of the ecosystem, let alone all of those of us who are sort of in the in-betweens, right, like the, the nonprofits that are trying to um, uh, either help bring transparency and light, groups like Sunlight Foundation, uh, or, um, or our, like my organization trying to help people think about these issues as they're designing tools or experiences or um, trying to think about alternatives to practices here. Do you have something you wanted to add, Stephen? No. I was just thinking. Yeah, just, I mean, I think uh, we have uh, seen also that just kind of where these questions that have existed for a while, they're, uh, they are being answered in, in ways that maybe are even more than we anticipated. And so, um, you know, with, with things like tracking of location from cell phones and from app uh, data, like there are data brokers that will just sell a feed of how people move in the public space. Often, I mean, this is not that uncommon in the commercial realm. Um, for things like citing a new store. And I think we have this question of, I think if we were all to get together and decide, okay, this thing is going to, maybe we wouldn't have decided this thing is going to exist. I'm not sure we had that conversation, but it does exist. 
And if we were all to decide what should we use it for, um, I'm not sure you know, like where to place the next Le Pen Quotidien is like the top thing on our list of, of what we should do collectively with this thing. Um, at the same, so I think cities are, are kind of faced with sometimes this impossible choice of um, either let's pretend it doesn't exist and, 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 um, and kind of limit the ways in which we can understand behavior in space. Um, or let's, let's participate in this thing that, that there are a lot of questions about. Right. Um, and I think that's, that's a tension I'm really interested in how, how we can further resolve. That's, yeah, that's great. I, well, you know, I think one of the things that we're hearing about is obviously this tension between you know, the transparency of knowing what's being collected, um, knowing that you're con how you're contributing, and knowing what's out there and who's, you know, who's doing that kind of collection but then also wanting to maintain some sense of privacy so that you feel secure and, and, and all of that information being out there. But fundamentally, even, even if just looking at that body of data um, in all these different, you know, it's those pros and cons, what I think that there's some question as you're bringing up, Stephen, about you know, how, what are the best ways of directing this data for public benefit as we think about our public spaces, because these are not necessarily private spaces, which then you could imagine, yeah, sure, you know, buy, buy data from the data broker and, you know, you can think about using that to, for private interests. But we're thinking about our public spaces. A lot of this data is collected from the public realm. You know, are there ways to, um, to make these approaches uh, to create a more just outcomes because there is a proliferation of data now that there, there never was before? The extent of data out there, is that a possibility? I think, I mean, one thing that, um, before we dig into that, it's not, this practice isn't necessarily new, right? Like, I mean, you're talking about going and counting people bringing soccer balls to a baseball, uh, to a basketball court and then saying, oh, maybe this actually should be a soccer field. But the difference there was people saw you with a clipboard, mm -hmm. right? And like that was, you know, okay, sure, we could probably have advertised the data collection was going to happen in advance, but there's also a person with a clipboard and a pencil where then the person showing up to be, who's going to get counted can say, I can see what's going on here, right? And now the, the big difference to now is like we can't see that the data is being collected and counted, and instead it's happening en masse um, in a much, uh, there's no, that friction has been taken away in a way that actually is maybe counterproductive. So an interesting question sort of uh, is how could we be introducing friction into this data collection process, maybe. Sorry, you were going to say something that when I cut you off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that um, our company in particular, this is, this is something that um, we think about a lot. Uh, because we have our sensors in the public right of way, there is no natural opt out as you might, you know, on a website or another, you know, digital interface. Um, and so the way we've kind of approached it is to try to manage um, the data lifecycle in the most responsible way possible. So one thing is the data itself, right? Are we collecting um, unique identifiers? That's true. Location, timestamp, this is all, um, it narrows down um, the possibilities for identifying an individual. Um, so that's definitely an important question. You know, how much data should we collect? Um, the approach that we're, we definitely take is something that we call whitelisting. So first we define what data we need and we collect that data, the minimum data needed to answer the city's question, and we don't collect other things. So that would be, you know, like uh, blacklisting where you collect the whole image, you send video footage, and then you just redact um, or you blur faces like uh, Google, Google Maps does, for example. So I think that approach is kind of a different way to think about the data itself. But also, you know, there's the question of how it's sent, what it's used for, um, how it's stored, is it deleted? And I think that um, that touches on other security concerns for data breach or misuse. Uh, making the data have a short life cycle is, is definitely one way that um, these potential vulnerabilities can be lowered. Yeah, it's been interesting um, in kind of interviewing um, like a dozen of, of the city uh, transportation managers who are working with new uh, DOCLAS mobility programs. We did see a range of, of how uh, places wanted to address the, the concerns around having um, individual trip level data. 
And um, it, that, that ranged from some cities that actually didn't even want to ingest it and wanted it to go to a third party, say a, uni a university or some other um, data management entity that could um, handle both the liability but also make certain commitments of, of their security. Um, two cities that want everything because I think they're, they're seeing this as if, if a private company is going to operate in our right of way, we need to have the same information that they have um, to kind of co-manage these new programs, this, these new you know, mobility systems. Um, so you know, the city of Los Angeles actually created a whole data specification, the mobility data specification, um, which, which a, a, any uh, vehicle that even passes through the boundary of, of Los Angeles, even if it's you know, starting in Santa Monica and, and ending in, I don't know my, my West Coast geography, but somewhere else that's not Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Even if that path goes through through LA, uh, they're requiring that the, the trip information be, be pushed to um, the city DOT, um, and I you know I think that's they see value in having that information um, for the purposes of say designing more multimodal streets for for street safety that kind of thing. I was, to come back to the question about justice, I think one of the, and how, what it means to have justice around this data, sort of what could be good data justice practices. Um, I mean, one place to start is also in, in the actual deciding of what data you need to collect, like involving the community in that process, right? Or involving, um, finding a way to co-design what that could look like. Uh, I think there's some really interesting projects the one I'm thinking about is was called the Morris Heights Morris Heights Justice Project. I think um, it was a project out of Cooney, uh, and they worked with residents in Morris Heights to talk about um, to figure out what issues were going on around policing, and then co-designed a survey with residents that the residents actually did the data collection door to door, and then co-analyzed it together at events like this, and did something with that, right? And then it started a conversation with the police force in the community around what they actually wanted to see. Um, and that, I mean, the sort of challenge when we're talking about sensors and technology is uh, there are so many sensors, we're kind of, we're trying to be opportunistic with the data that's there rather than still starting from this intentional place. Mm. And even, I mean, it's great to think about the, how do we minimize it? I think the next stage could be, how could we think about working with the community that we're collecting data about to decide what that minimization should look like, or if there are ways to be creative about, um, you know, are there things we need to know that might mean we need more sensitive data, but are there ways that we could collect it where there's a really active consent process, things like that. Yeah, I, th I think you mentioned something that's so critical, or it came up in multiple places, which is um, kind of just getting it out there and having a conversation. And for that to happen, there needs to be, uh, you know, uh, some, some, some norms around, um, letting the community know what is being collected and when and why. Um, and so, you know, I think it, one of the trends I've seen that's, that's really interesting is, um, I, I first learned about this from the city of Seattle, but there are a few different communities that, that have, have adopted policies uh, around publishing a master list of surveillance technologies um, and with an explanation of just what, it, what, is, what is this technology, what information does it collect, and why is it installed? And I think, um, to have that kind of informed dialogue with, with the community or with, with the city at large, um, we need to have just the basics of description of just what is happening on the ground. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I, uh, there was a piece of model policy put out by the ACLU um, through their COPS, C-O-P-P-S program, um, that is, is trying to push exactly that agenda of just publishing um, the basics of what technology is out there, what information is collecting, and why. You guys, I just want to um, push on this, these um, really, really great examples of solutions to some of the challenges, the current challenges out there, and thought that um, each of you could maybe talk a little bit about what would, what would be the like, number one priority to put in place to make the data collection, the community, input side happen or the, you know the justice um, um, possibilities more available to the cities because I think that the capacity to collect data and to analyze it already is quite a struggle for a lot of localities so a lot of localities don't have like a data team maybe like LA did to set up that standard for example and um, since we're talking about these great solutions like what would you say now that you've seen some examples 
what could be put in place that would make a big difference? I mean, I know one example, I realize we're talking, we've mentioned Seattle maybe <laughs> three times so far, but um, Seattle does have a community technology advisory board, uh, which is a super interesting model that um, I think, you know, it could be replicated in other places. I think there's some uh, where there are, are citizens that are elected to a group that actually has to approve all technology decisions that are made by the city government. Um, and so then you at least have like representative review, right? I think that's a really interesting first step that then can become more local conversations um, and that's something that uh, allows you to have more people engaging in the community, things like that. We've worked with them um, on a project that we did around internet measurement uh, in Seattle where they were some of our early feedback on this um, tool that Seattle wanted to put out to do more measurement of like what does access actually look like in our community and uh, we did, it was really helpful to get engagement from them. I mean from the macro level I think partly um, a thing that is is really critical that is that's beyond the control of cities is uh, r regulating the private sector um, and so I, I think you know as I was mentioning earlier like this information of where you are and uh, exists and it is being used uh, in the in the private sector and I, I think to to really address that impossible choice that cities have um, I think we, we really need to think about it from that macro level perspective, which is, is likely going to require a national conversation. Um, you know, and I, I think looking to models of, of you know, what's being done within the state of California uh, or, or with GDPR in Europe, I, I think we need to have a conversation like that in the US. Um, and then I think using qualitative approaches um, and realizing that I think this idea of intentionality and, and whitelisting, starting with, with an objective and building from there is so crucial. Um, we're working uh, on a, at Stay, we're working on a project in um, Rhode Island that involves autonomous vehicles. And one of the things that was really interesting um, when we were doing just a, a landscape uh, assessment of other autonomous vehicles pilots and how they're, what, what sorts of data is being collected and how they're being evaluated, um, is that for many of them, it's just let's grab all of the automated feeds that these vehicles are producing and then make decisions about the program from there. Um, what we enjoyed about this project is it has a, 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 an intentional kind of community survey and qualitative lens to it. Um, and so I think when new technologies are, are introduced, having it introduced as a pilot and having those intentional conversations um, just with the communities affected or with, with the users um, is, is critical and, and really needs to be a best practice. Mm. Right. Yeah, to kind of third, um, <clears throat> that point about the local approach, I think that the balance between like what constitutes useful data and then a privacy violation is so, um, it's, it's very local, right? Um, this is a decision that is hard to make across the board. So um, completely agreed with that um, and to support that, that point, the first point that you made, Stephen, about um, regulation, I think something that I would love to see um, is for um, the industry, I don't know, industry leaders, probably ideally not the big tech companies, to help create a standard framework for assessing um, mm -hmm. security challenges, or how, how can we like compare the security practices of two companies, you know? What are those key markers? Is there a score, um, a safety score, if you will, um, data? health score, things like that, um, that hopefully can support the policymakers as they um, are actually making policy. Um, what we see now is a lot of self-regulation. So um, tech companies will make their, you know, a charter or sort of an ethics guiding principle document that lives in static form, doesn't get updated very often. But um, the problem is the technologies are updating very quickly, right? And um, I think it's important that um, as they change, we have a framework for evaluating them that adapts as quickly. And I was going to point, there's two projects that are, uh, for along those lines that might be interesting. One is called Ranking Digital Rights. Uh, it's an organization that does um, an annual, their new ranking, their next ranking should be coming out soon. But they do an annual ranking of the big tech companies and some telecom companies um, 
globally on how they adhere to human rights in the digital space. So they look at freedom of expression, privacy, uh, and, I'm not, and transparency, I think is the third one. And they look through specifically a lot of their policies. Um, they do analysis on the technologies themselves. And a lot of what they look at is also like, how does this company um, actually protect users? What are their, what's their follow through look like? Like what's the difference between their charter and their practices? Uh, it's super interesting. So I would definitely recommend looking at that. And there's been, um, branching from that, there's an initiative that Consumer Reports has been leading called the Digital Standard, uh, which is looking a lot at security issues in the sort of IoT space. They're kind of starting with hardware, but they're doing, they have like an evaluation framework um, with a security and privacy lens for things like uh, nanny cams and like the smart, all the smart devices that were adding to our homes, partly because we can't even control <laughs> what technology is in them. Um, but it's a really, I think that's sort of trying to get at that. And I do, it would be interesting to see more companies voluntarily uh, adopt th like the standards from the digital standard. Because if we don't start having those conversations, we don't know where those standards aren't enough yet. Mm. Right? And that's, we, we may not have them finished yet. They need to kind of be things we're iterating on and evolving and testing. And seeing where we can that's agree. That's great. Um, I, the one last question I wanted to um, put in front of the panel before we open it up to the audience is just really, you know, what strikes me about a lot of the solutions and the approaches is how much interaction it requires with other human beings. And we're talking a lot about things that are data and technology driven, um, but fundamentally it seems like there's um, quite a significant human touch that's threaded throughout all these different systems and um, just touching on this, you know, could inequalities be reproduced as we're sorting this out and, you know, sort of a thought piece, but it is, it, it, it just strikes me as something to really consider um, as you are actually fundamentally working out some solutions. Could inequalities be reproduced? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, absolutely. I think, you know, they don't call it systemic racism uh, <laughs> without the context of it being a systemic issue. Um, anytime we're talking about these systems and data, like that's something that we need to be thinking about. Like what, how, what are the systems that have already affected and created inequalities that we're trying to, that we're interacting with? I think it's really hard to do and the only way you can do it is by engaging with the impacted communities um, and, and making sure that you're uh, also giving like a bit of a historical lens of what what led to this situation now like why um, why are we how do we get here in the first place and then what are we trying to adjust um, we were there was an event uh, earlier this week and I was talking with someone afterwards about um, we you know we're talking about smart cities maybe our goals shouldn't be around the cities being smarter our goals should be around the cities being more equitable and if technology can facilitate that equity like that's a more interesting uh, so situation for us to be in than just making them smart, right? Like, let's go for equitable cities that can be where we see more justice pl taking place and how can technology help us get there, I think is an interesting question. Right. Do you have any, do you guys have any other? Well, I think who gets counted and who gets measured is, is a critical question, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think um, there are two sides to that. One being, you know, if, if you've got um, uh, data that's being pulled just from where you're deciding to look, uh, whether that's where you've installed a sensor, or what, you know, if you're collecting RFIDs from devices, people have to have those devices to be counted. Um, and I, I think the um, the other, the flip side of it is that, uh, um, so you know, this desire to for, uh, the, the kind of benefit of being observed is that um, you can your needs can be better catered to. If, if you envision some magnanimous, you know, philosopher king government, um, but if, if it, on the flip side, there's, uh, I think, in, in an urban context in particular, com communities of color um, have a uh, there's a large history of of that not being the case of, of observability leading to bad things, and so I, I, that is the, the the fundamental tension is you know if we if we if it's very easy for the government to have a list of names of everyone in Tahrir Square or uh, of everyone in Zuccotti Park, for that matter, um, I, I'm not sure that we want that technology to be at someone's fingertips. Um, and it, again, to me, the, the key is to have a, 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 a public democratic discussion about what that right balance is in a given public space. Mm -hmm. um, and it might vary from space to space. If a, if a park is in um, 
a, a community where the surveillance and um, targeted policing has been a, a key issue. Um, you know, maybe the, the level of, of observation or automated data collection that we want to, that that community wants is going to be different than in a very different type of space. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the, the final component there is, is who is doing the collecting also really matters, I think, to me. Um, what's neat about the Gale uh, standard to, to me is in, in, in survey tools is that if it, it can put that decision of who collects in the hands of the community itself. Um, if, if someone, if I'm a planner and a community comes to me and says, hey, I did, I, I've gone out and I collected this information and hey, we're using this basketball court for, for futsal and here are the numbers to back it up, that's a compelling thing. And it, you know, this idea of surveillance versus surveillance of, of bottom up, let's, let's understand ourselves um, in a way that, that is less asymmetrical in terms of who has power and who knows the things. Do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, uh, just a quick thought. Um, I guess on the technical side, um, something that's hard with algorithms, especially when we get into deep learning or machine learning, is it's hard to explain those decision-making processes, right? Even to people who built them. Um, there's a lot of things that are hidden, uh, maybe in the data, maybe in the structure of the network. Um, this isn't, it isn't designed to be human understandable. Um, so I think um, to bring it back to the whole um, standards, I think that for the algorithms that we have, we need better standards for that too. Um, I think that uh, who, uh, researchers should, rep you know, like they should report um, where the data comes from. Um, there should be markers so people can measure how um, inclusive it is. Um, and then also in the decision making process itself, um, there should be better ways for, for people to understand how algorithms are actually making these choices. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you for this discussion. We're going to open up to the audience. Fatima, do you want, um, is there a way that you want us to run around with the mics or? So okay, can, you're, you're going to run? run? Okay, mic. cool. I saw one actually here, Tracy. Yeah, hi. Um, this has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much to all the panelists. Um, my question is about, um, Thinking about local governments, uh, you know, as the as potentially the collectors, but certainly as the users of these kinds of monitoring data, um, I I personally feel like there is a there's a huge unmet need um, to think about the ethics of this. And Stephen, you in particular, have done a really good job of raising some of that stuff. So just as a quick example, I worked on a traffic monitoring project where we put passive monitors on a trail facility to count how many people were using the trail. This is kind of, it's like your really basic like public space use thing. So, you know, one of the things we found out was that, um, uh, you know, it's a, you know, from the county's perspective, a recreational trail facility that closes at dusk. But I'm sure it will come as a shock to none of you when I tell you that we found out that people were using the trail at night. It's, <laughs> the trail connects a transit station and a working class community and in, incredibly enough, people need to, go to and from uh, their origins and destinations 24 hours a day, not just when the sun happens to be illuminating them directly. And you know, the local park and rec authority was like, this is great, now we know exactly when we need to park the cop cars at the trailhead. Perfect, we can really target the enforcement, this is so helpful. And I, I mean, just, I'm just raising this as an example of how just like every, Stephen's not describing a hypothetical. It's, it's right. super real. And it's not something that can be solved by saying like, oh, well, a nonprofit has the trail traffic monitoring data. It's like, you can't, once you know, you cannot unknow. And I don't think it works as an answer to say like, oh gosh, then I'd rather not know. What's needed instead is this, this much larger you know, embrace of, of a more just and a more equitable framework for decision making that says, now I found out the truth about my after dusk policy, I need to put in some lights on this thing and leave it open 24 hours a day because people are using it. You know, I, it, it doesn't take a ton of common sense to, to, to see that you need to get to that point. But the only way to get there is, Georgia, to get to what you were saying about broadening the conversation in terms of bringing the community into the decision-making process 
to provide some of that common sense and, and some of those values to say, you know, thanks, police. Really appreciate you trying to do your job the best way possible and efficiently use your resources, but there's a different decision we need to make here. That, that decision cannot get made just by the public sector or just by the private sector. Advocates have to be organized and at the table too. I'm interested to hear from each of you your thoughts on how to organize that capacity and if you've seen any great examples of that happening. The other, um, before we dig into that, one quick thought, which is also as the, the group doing that data collection, you know, again, back to the clipboards and paper stage, um, you may have had time ranges where you marked people into the time ranges as opposed to a timestamp with like way more accuracy now, right? So there's an interesting question of how could we minimize like, um, oh, sorry, I was like, I think it, what you were saying, how could we minimize what data we're collecting so we're not getting a full timestamp, but we're saying like, oh, between these hours, or yes, there's this many people using it after dusk so that it, we can't misuse the data afterwards, right? So like, are we collecting stuff that's too precise that isn't necessary for our actual purpose as well, right? And that's something that can come from those conversations if you have a collaborative process in deciding how to do that data collection at all, um, as you might identify like, this could be a risk, so maybe we shouldn't collect data at this, at this fine-grained level. To me, the, 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 the scariest um, arrangement of the, of the project you just described is the one in which the local government is the only one that knows that the data is, that there's a counter now on that trail, and the only one who has the data that shows that people are using the trail, and that nobody, and, and so then all of a sudden there's enforcement, but nobody, like no one actually knows the full story. Oh my god, how did they find me? Um, because I think, <laughs> I, think the, I, I think the way that those, um, those advocates and other actors who need to like uh, exert influence on how data is used and interpreted in, in those kinds of situations, the only way they can do that is if that data is available and if that, that process is disclosed. So things like dis a, a, a master list of surveillance technology with a description of why it, what's its, what data is collected, why is it being used. And then also, again, I think um, if, if, if it is appropriately fuzzed in the way that Georgia was describing or if it can be in, in something like summary counts, um, having making sure there's access to that, so that you know, if if the first interpretation from the the, the, the local police department is, oh, let's enforce after dark, there can be other voices that are that are pulling from that same source of truth, and that it can't be a question of just who knows the truth, but actually of of you know a political discussion that exactly. democracy needs to be of you this is how we're interpreting that truth. It is the law. The trails closed after dark. <clears throat> you can't blame the police for wanting to enforce the law. Sure. Do you have anything you want to add, Jennifer? Yeah, um, I will just say that I feel like um, in the pilots of we, that we've done, um, one of the more interesting ones has been in downtown Brooklyn with um, the Circular City Group, so New Labs Group, and um, by default, a lot more voices were brought to the table, so researchers, um, other tech companies, and also other public groups. And the, the fact is the data is useful for a lot of different people. It shouldn't just, it's not just useful for the, the one who requested it, right? And what I saw was we were able to have a lot more interesting conversations when there were more people at the table. Um, instead of just laser focusing on that one thing on that one group's mind, um, it was much broader. So, I mean, yeah, just this, to um, second everyone's point that this needs to be a bigger conversation. Instead of just between one data collector and one group, it should be arranged. One of the things that's fascinating to me about the, the Numina data is I know that you all, your heat maps can show like a path of, say, where people are jaywalking. Have you ever seen that used in the context of like let's enforce jaywalking or or kind of is that a concern that you all think through? Um, luckily, from the, the partner we're working with there, um, it's specifically in downtown Brooklyn where we are seeing a lot of mid-block crossings, is it's it's mostly from a safety standpoint. Yeah. So the question is, if pedestrians are crossing here, why is that happening? And what we found out is, you know, construction kept moving um, up and down that street, so pedestrians had to cross in the road. Um, and what we found was like a very disturbing amount of road share between bikes, pedestrians, buses, trucks, all in the same lane. Um, so in that case, um, it was more about how can we make things safer rather
rather than let's punish people for just doing what they have to do. I won't hold this too long. I just want to point out one interesting language shift you also just did, where you said jaywalking and you said mid-block crossing. Yeah. And like that's a really interesting <laughs> sure. point too, right? Like there's language frameworks that we use that criminalize some of what we're saying, right? Like obviously people are using the path after dark. Um, yeah. Right. And if you think of them as trail users and as mid-block crossers instead of trespassers and jaywalkers, the conversation shifts. And so like, sometimes we need to really think about what's the language we're using when we're having that conversation. Absolutely. I have a question here. Thanks for coming. Um, so this is a little bit of historical context. About two years ago, I'm part of the Project Management Institute. So I had a very fabulously successful talk about the use of IoT in project management. <laughs> so that's actually the question I want to ask in reverse, because the same issues got brought up two years ago, as all of you were just highlighting right now. There's no data standardization. You've got lots of problems with how it's collected, where it's ending up, who's talking to who about what. <laughs> so the, the question in reverse is, how do we overlay some project management processes to sort of standardize how the standards get made? <laughs> where the information ends up and what it is that's the result of all of that. I mean, so that we don't end up with sort of, it, I'm sure all of you read the very interesting articles about how the Strava data yeah. <laughs> leaked out and designated CIA bases where they're not supposed to, where nobody's supposed to have that information. And, and, and there was just another article last week about UN forces having similar, so, and that, those are very extreme examples. But just the, the, to use the extreme to highlight the more mundane, right? Yeah. So you want to take that? Uh, I, your question, it was a lot of layers of abstraction, so I'm not <laughs> sure. Um, I followed it, but a quick thought. I think the Strava, the Strava example, I think, is a really great um, example to me of, again, like, uh, um, that relates to the point from over here. Um, this was an instance where kind of a bunch of people got together and uh, were contributing their data to the global heat map. And for those who are unfamiliar with the story, um, this included folks who are, Strava is an app that, that tracks running routes and paths, um, also for cyclists and things like this. Um, and it revealed the location of uh, military bases just based on where people were running. Um, and, you know, I think we, we had this uh, immediate reaction of, okay, this, is a, this has, has been a privacy breach. But then my reaction was also, oh, we're revealing the location of secret military bases. Maybe it's good that we now know, you know, like where, where the military does, you know, like we're holding power to account. Thanks, Strava, for your transparency yeah, initiative. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, but, I, but I think it speaks to this idea of like not, you know, like, I think we have, we have it's kind of like we're all, um, extending our uh, our collective vision and, and like uh, memory like if everybody had um, picture perfect memory we would all our norms would be very different and it's kind of we're, we're in this augmented uh, te technology is like augmenting our our, our natural you know uh, ability to, to memorize and see um, and I, I think it's it like I th it, we're gonna have to confront that. And uh, I, I don't know, this doesn't relate to project management at all, so. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I don't, my immediate, my immediate thought on the project management question is um, that we all kind of need to slow down and be a little bit more intentional about things that we do. And those of us who are running those processes need to say like, hey, do we need to do this this way? Um, what are we not thinking of? What are the sort of threats and risks to us, to the people we're working with, to our communities by not, um, by not asking enough questions, really, right? And so it's sort of a, on the, you know, if, if you are a project manager dealing with technology projects or not, just like data projects in general, what are the things that, what protections do you need to build into your process yeah. to allow for those conversations to happen, right? Did we consult enough people? Did we make sure we actually consult enough people that um, represent the community? Could we have done it in a way where they could actually co-design what we're doing in the first place? Uh, you know, are we flagging concerns? How could this get misused? Um, there's a really interesting uh, site that I'm not going to remember the name of at the moment, but um, it basically gives you a bunch of, uh, it's like, oh, tarot cards of tech, if you look this up, but it has a bunch of contexts of like <laughs> ways that data could be misused so you can kind of work through different scenarios that are more threat and risk focused. So there's, um, you know, I mean, 
many of us have probably been in relationships and you've shared information with a partner and then when you break up, like what's, when you're talking about a, uh, a, a burned partner, right? Like how does that data get used differently? And so there's a lot of, it's, there are, I don't know, 12 or so of these, but how could we think differently about the threats and risks that could play out in this context that we don't, we're not trained to think about in the first place because we want to believe everything's going to be good, but not everyone has the same goals or intentions. So how can we, how can we shift our processes to include concerns and risks and threats like that? I, well, just to, um, to touch on that point briefly, the threats and risks to me, I think, speak to an earlier point that you made about the way we use language and the users of the data and the perspectives that they're going to take because you had a, Stephen, you had such a different reaction than maybe someone within the military. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I think that's, like, that's fundamental, right? Because I think same, similar with language, different people will use different languages depending on their roles and that's just something to keep in mind. We have another question over there. Yeah, hi, I'm going to do a parenthetical. Um, my husband teaches project management on military bases, so you can imagine what my mixed feelings were about this. So the first one was I hope those folks don't get hurt. Um, just so we're <laughs> talking about that and I'm not surprised that that would happen since folks in, on military bases are often big jocks. What I would like you guys to model is um, who, what does a neighborhood data activist look like, right? We're talking about groups, we're talking about Question. people. Um, what, I mean, and again, I don't want to say I'm patronizing, how do you educate folks so that that happens? How do they learn, you know, it, going back to the trail model, who gets involved, how do you teach them, how do they know that something is in a box and needs to be out of a box? Georgia? <laughs> oh my God. Um, that's a good question. And I, I think there's a lot of things that that can look like. I mean, one, you know, to take us back to some maybe basic Jane Jacobs style practices, like it's the people who you have to participate in your community in the first place, right? So being someone, know your, know your neighbors, know what your community looks like, be a part of it. Um, I was, uh, last week I went to my neighborhood bank to, because um, I needed to deal with something related to our bank account, and I was, uh, I didn't realize this, but our bank hosts like financial um, workshops. So they were running a class on um, IRAs and like retirement planning and things like that. And I was sitting there and talking to the person at the bank being like, I didn't know that you guys do this. And they were like, yeah, we're trying to not be the big bad bank. And so we do these every week and we almost always have 20 to 30 people here. And it's like, oh, Maybe I should go and be at those and just like learn, meet my neighbors, see what questions they have, what are ways that we can be in any conversation talking about other things that affect us in our community and, and need to be making a difference. Like go to your libraries, right? Like what are, where are people going for support on these things where we can start talking about uh, what's happening in our communities, what concerns we have and how we can um, bring that and think about how to solve the problems that we're recognizing. But a lot of it's about starting from recognizing how you can engage in your community better, where people gather, what, can, what are things that people are worried about, where can we uh, maybe move ourselves back into the physical space and talk to each other um, and not just you know, get into fights on neighborhood mailing lists. Yeah, and I think, I think back to the comment about language, I think, I think we all need to do a better job of thinking about just activists as data activists and this idea of, of it being somehow a different thing uh, maybe one story I can speak to is that um, we worked with a, a, a gentleman in, in the city of Detroit who was an Uber driver who cared about uh, public murals in that city. And he had just taken photos of a, a massive inventory, really, of the city's public murals on, uh, on, on a variety of buildings. And um, he, he recorded just the location of these murals, the artist, if it was known. Um, and, a, and a photo of all of those, and he had a blog. And to me, that was a, a neighborhood data activism. He was, he was keeping this public inventory, and, and what we did to work with them um, was we, we structured the, this, this inventory of murals and um, created a civic data set out of it. So I think one of the things we need to do is think about, you know, if, if our decision making in, in the public realm is going to become more data driven, um, we have to make sure that we're building systems that allow um, or you know, sources of information that we might not right now think of as data um, to be ingested and then thought of as data. Um, and so I, I think um, you know, if, that's, if that's something like talking to someone who's gone out and done a lot of observations of a space and teaching them how to use the Gale methodology to, to kind of record what they're seeing, 
um, or if that's taking information that's already been collected and, and structuring it, making sure it can, can work with other types of civic information, I, I think th that's the work that needs to be done. Great. Okay, there's a question right here. Yes, uh, thank you. So sometimes to me, I, think, I believe it boils down to who owns and manages the data. And you know, you hear about this concept of data trusts and public-private partnerships. And I'd be interested to know what you think about that and how it is not just a way for government and private sector partners to work together, but also for, for citizens to contribute and opt out of certain observations, yeah. right? And I'd be interested to know, too, how, you know, what would the, the private sector uh, panelists on, on the stage would think about that, say, you know, they bake it in, intelligence without surveillance and all that into your mission statement, but say you got, a, got acquired by some big company. That's a good exit for you, but is there any guarantee that they'll have the same principles and protect the data the way you were protecting it? That's great. Want to start kick this one off, Jennifer? Yeah, no, that's definitely fair. Um, I think these are definitely areas that we're actively trying to build right now, um, not in isolation, but hopefully with the communities that we're in. Um, I guess one small way of us doing this is um, it, it has become clear to us that you know we're getting a lot of feedback from maybe elected officials or community partners, but um, it's time to collect much more data from the people that might be you know detected by our sensors. We need that data. We we have an idea just from people we talk to, but um, we need more of it um, and more from each community. So one idea that um, we hope to implement this year is to um, host digital spaces. Physical would be great too, um, but for sure to have digital spaces where citizens can provide feedback to us on anything, privacy concerns, the, um, items that they would like detected, maybe there's a lot of rats, a lot of trash bags in that corner, whatever the specific nuances are for that community. Um, we want to have that space where um, people can give feedback and also see what other people are saying. So it's a starting point. It's definitely not the solution, but um, these are some of the things we're thinking about right now. Anything? Yeah, and just I think to harken back to the idea of, of regulation. I mean, I, as a on the private sector side, I think um, the more something like a, a data trust or or clear provisions about how data will be owned and managed is is helpful to us. Um, and so I think some you know having that I'd want that built into any contract that we we make with the city. Um, precisely to prevent that kind of scenario you were describing of something like an acquisition um, or, or other sorts of changes. Great. Last question here. Yes. Yeah. Hi, folks. Um, I appreciate hearing um, all the speakers talk a lot about working with the community, um, but I'm curious, or I'd like, I'd love to hear from folks um, a little bit more about what exactly that means. Um, touching a little bit back on language again, uh, I feel like inevitably when you initiate or when those conversations come up, there are imbalances in language and access and understanding. How do you reckon with those imbalances? Great question. I mean, I think uh, I, I, I'll say, caveating this, I recognize it's really hard to do well, but if you um, are going to spend the, the time to do it, you might as well put in the effort to like do it as fully as you can, right? So holding um, meetings where people actually can get to, holding them in the languages that are spoken in those communities, uh, figuring out how to facilitate with translators and childcare, <laughs> right, to make sure that people can actually participate fully, having them at times of day when uh, you get a range of participants, having them at multiple times of day so that you're not just only getting people who can come after work or on a Saturday, because there are people who work on Saturdays, right? Recognizing the sort of fullness of what um, participating in your community or and allowing community participation looks like, uh, I think is sort of the, the first, uh, it's, it's a good process to follow if you're doing a consultation in that way. I think you can also think about how to have more creatively designed um, projects where the communities drive that process themselves. So like the, the Morris Heights project that I was referencing earlier, um, that was, that, that was com residents in the community deciding what they wanted to do and sort of facilitated by uh, folks from, from CUNY. Um, I, there was a project that we did a few years ago in 
in Red Hook that the project is still going, but uh, they're running it on their own now. Um, the, the Red Hook Wi-Fi project uh, that was all built by young adults in the neighborhood. Um, it's still an ongoing thing. They have a program that's modeled after. Um, there's some other folks here. I think there's a session in the next one about community networks. I would go to that. They do. They have a lot of really good practices there around um, building up digital stewards in the community and having them uh, actually lead the process themselves. So, like, what is it? What does it look like actually if you were to let the community run the process and you just sort of helped and listened? Uh, I think is a really interesting question. Great. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Thank you, panelists. Let's give them a hand for their wonderful remarks. Enjoy the rest of the day.